this, this is the first time I've given a book talk where half the people in the room are in the index. <laughs> you, you all looked at the index. <laughs> yeah, you did. You really did. Uh, let, me, let me begin at the beginning. I met Bill Buckley by writing for him. I grew up in Irondequoit, New York, a suburb of Rochester, a mid-size upstate city with my parents and my older brother, Bob. In the fall of 1969, I was a freshman in the local public high school. I didn't know anybody who went to private ones. My brother was a junior at Yale. Every weekend of the school year since he had gone away to college, I wrote him on a small black metal typewriter that had belonged to mom, a letter rehearsing the events of the week. Basketball games, school plays, little triumphs, tiny disasters, bulletins of adolescence dramatized and ironized. One week, the news barged into this home theater. Opponents of the Vietnam War had called for a nationwide moratorium, or day of protests, on October 15th. The moratorium looked to be a big thing on college campuses, where teach-ins and boycotts of classes were planned. Some kids in my high school decided to join in. I thought they were wrong. I also thought there was something phony about the exercise, simultaneously preening and copycat. The moratorium supporters at Irondequoit High presented themselves as dissidents, but they were tagging along with a national movement, mimicking their elders. I decided to put counter posters, anti-protest protests, on the school walls. I imagined myself as a latter-day Martin Luther taping rather than hammering up criticisms of orthodoxy for all to see. I generated my posters by typing them out over and over on the black typewriter using carbon paper to produce four copies at a time. I had only 12 contentious theses, not Luther's 95. After a night's work, I gave my posters to the world on the 15th. All my efforts and the more organized protests of moratorium day that I hoped to deflate went into that weekend's letter to my brother. It made for a longer story than usual, and in his next letter home, he said he had enjoyed it. Then my father said, why don't you send it to National Review? No one in my family knew anything about journalism. We knew William F. Buckley Jr. from television, and we had been subscribing to his magazine for half a year. Perhaps that would be entree enough. I took Dear Bob off the beginning of my letter, added a conclusion, and sent it away. <laughs> Months passed without a word from National Review. I assumed they had not liked the submission and thrown it away, and that this was standard procedure in journalism. Then, after the new year, I got a letter from C.H. Simons, Assistant Managing Editor. Dear Mr. Brookheiser, please forgive our slowness in dealing with your manuscript. It somehow got buried on my desk. This, I would learn, actually was standard procedure in journalism. <laughs> Miss Buckley, Priscilla Buckley, Bill's older sister and managing editor, Mr. Buckley and I have read it and are eager to publish it. He added, we do receive manuscripts from people your age, but I'm sure this will be the first we've ever published. Anyone who submits something for the approval of the world expects in some corner of his mind that he will be approved. But when approval actually came, it was startling. The world of public events, which included the media that reported on them, was out there. Now someone from out there had signaled back. More surprises followed when my article appeared in the issue dated February 24th, 1970, one day after my 15th birthday. It was the cover story. Moratorium Day at Irondequoit High, said the headline by Rick Brookheiser, student. The next surprise, a few weeks later, was a check for $180. <laughs> 
The question of money had given me some anxiety. It must cost something, I thought, to print magazines and distribute them. Perhaps I would be asked to contribute to help defray expenses. The idea that I might be paid, in addition to being published, was icing on the cake. About the time the check arrived, I began getting letters from readers. There were 20 in all, which would be piddling response in the days of email and texting. But in 1969, when each of these communications had to be sealed, stamped, and dropped in a mailbox, it seemed impressive, all the more to someone who had never gotten a letter from anyone he did not know. I know why the assistant managing editor, Miss Buckley, and Mr. Buckley published it. I was a dog walking on its hind legs. Fifteen-year-old speaks. I was also dog bites man. There were plenty of young people, even in the late 60s, who were conservative or simply not liberal. But they were not the young people you saw on television or in most magazines or newspapers. The archetypal young people of the major media, whether admired or feared, were idealistic liberals, hairy radicals, or copulating druggies, heroes, rebels, or freaks. Here, said the editors of National Review, was a kid, a high school freshman no less, who speaks for the unseen. There was one more reaction to the piece, the most important of all. A blue three by five card with National Review's name and address in bold and an italicized identifier, William F. Buckley, Jr., editor. Below that, in spindly red ink, a message, something like, Richard, nice going, congratulations, or Rick, very nice, thanks. In time, I would learn that every contributor to every issue of National Review got such a card from William F. Buckley, Jr., which did not diminish its value, rather the reverse. The cards were a courtesy in a profession that often skipped courtesies. Over the years, I saved many such cards, a fraction of all the ones I was sent. Since they are undated, I can't tell now which one came first. No matter, it was, they were, a beam of attention from the top. And then I go on a little bit to give the backstory of Bill and the backstory of me taking us up to 1970. And the introduction ends, at 44, Bill's age, when he accepted my article, he was conscious of the passage of time. In the early 60s, William Rickenbacker, a younger colleague, sat in on one of his interviews. Bill was in fine form, like a jet with a switchblade. The reporter saved his toughest question for walking out the door. Bill smartly knocked it aside. When the door closed, he turned to Rickenbacker and grinned, I can keep this shit up until I'm 40. <laughs> he kept it up much longer. But even an enfant terrible senses when he is no longer literally an enfant. Out of the blue, here came a kid pulling the same stunts he had pulled in college, only he was doing it in high school. Bill may have thought, even then, maybe I found another me. Now, the rest of the book and the next uh, 40 years of my life have three movements, which are already, already there in that, that, that opening that I read you. And the first of these movements is a portrait. It's a portrait of a remarkable and a consequential man. Uh, one of the reasons um, for doing this book is that uh, we are losing Bill a bit. His TV show went off the air in 1999. And young people who started becoming media conscious after that moment no longer know who he is. Uh, my wife and I go out to dinner a lot, so we're hobnobbing a lot with waiters and waitresses who are all kids, and they don't know in the way they would certainly have known in 1990, 1980, 1975. Of course they would have known who Bill Buckley was, even if they never read National Review or saw Firing Line, just because he was out there. People were imitating him, et cetera, et cetera. So, as happens to every figure of the media, 
part of him has now passed. 